Kia ora everyone. Uh, good to be back. Um, I'll be uh, talking to you about um, some of the findings that we came across uh, with a discrete pilot project around iBeacons. And as a disclaimer before I really get into it, is uh, many of those challenges that we um, encountered have already been encountered by other people dealing with this technology as well. And um, some of the issues that we were um, struggling with have already been solved in the interim. But um, we started a year ago, and at that time, uh, things weren't just quite as far as they are yet uh, now. And so it's probably worthwhile noting that stuff's evolving, evolving so fast, and the landscape of it is changing so quickly that whatever you're putting into place uh, needs to allow for rapid iteration as the technology matures and new standards emerge. So on that uh, disclaimer, what are iBeacons? iBeacons um, are what it says. They're little small, low-power transmitters helping smartphones determine their precise position, proximity, or context. So they look, there's, there's variable, uh, you know, various flavors of them, but they look a bit like this. Small little things that you can stick to an object or a display case or whatever you else uh, fancy. And then you have a phone that has an app that can read the signals that this thing emits, and as I get closer to it, it can, my phone can do something. So it can you know, buzz or bring up a piece of content, play back a piece of audio, and that's all it does really. It's, it's really just telling the phone, hey, you're close to me, do something about it sort of thing. Um, this pilot, as all good things, started with a hypothesis. Um, which in this case was this, as a visitor, I want to be able to access in-depth information about the objects I'm looking at to quench my thirst for knowledge. That's a pretty generic statement, uh, I'm very aware of that, but uh, what we wanted to, um, to do is, is uh, try and figure out whether this technology, proximity, awareness uh, combined with mobile devices could help deliver on this need. So what we did is we um, put 12 of these beacons up in uh, one of our galleries, um, invisible to the public. So we just stuck them under the, the uh, um, display cases or behind the objects. And then we had a customized version of the My Tours app to serve up content as you would get closer to the beacons. And um, then we just kind of went for it and uh, tried it out and learned a few things. So um, with the things that we've learned, so we've tested with a very small sample group and we're not quite done with the pilot yet either, so um, we will go through a bit more user testing as um, we wrap this up. But in terms of the things that we have learned, I can already tell you now, uh, herding or working with beacons is a bit like herding cats, vanishing cats for that matter, because um, they do get lost. They all look the same on, 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 the, uh, on the outside, so it's really hard to tell once you have a pile of them lying around which object uh, they, they belong to. Um, and um, the adhesive isn't as strong as it says, so they fall off, and visitors are attracted to little technology-looking like thingies, so they take them and they're gone. Um, Display team moves them because they don't know what they are and they haven't been briefed on the pilot. <laughs> they get bricked because the firmware upgrade through the app just didn't quite work that well. Um, so we ended up with three uh, lost beacons to date and it might be more by now, who knows. Um, but it's probably safe to say that there's a lot of things to consider in terms of placing these and installing these beacons that have a very, very direct impact on the performance of these things. Um, so that does change, po uh, that, that poses challenges for the scalability of these systems. We're thinking about rolling these out across um, the entire building. Um, does that mean that more beacons equal more trouble? Uh, don't know yet. With, uh, with new fleet management um, apps and, and, and sort of ways around to, to you know, bulk configure these things, uh, things might get easier. Um, but 
It does take a lot of, lot of manual tweaking to get a well calibrated system, especially if you do it yourself. And striking a balance between the response time, so how quickly will this thing be picked up by your phone, uh, the signal bleed, you know, conflicting um, beacons sending signals and they're getting picked up by your phone at the same time. And the granularity of the setup, so how many of these things can you actually uh, shove into a display case uh, while still having a good user experience. Um, not so many, is the answer. Um, so it's really trying to, to work all those factors out to get a good system going. And uh, you will need an app for it. So uh, either you'll have your own app or you'll find someone to partner with who has an app. But uh, it comes with a whole raft of consequences that um, we're all trying to, to get around. Um, that these apps entail, so that's just something to keep in mind. As, of course, with, with, a, you know, with a technology pilot, what you hope is that the technology works and just blends into the background and lets the, uh, the content shine. So what we did is also look at, at different types of content and how well they work. And as we all know, in this room, there is a tendency, museum wishful thinking, to just give them all we got and attach it to the object and they will love it. Uh, but what we found is that flooding already overwhelmed visitors with dense museum content doesn't necessarily work that well. So if you give them a longish blog on the giant moa, chances are that they're just going to read the heading and then they're going to go and, and look for the next beacon to scan and that's it. Um, so even with that small sample group that we, that we tested, visitors didn't want to consume lengthy text text on their mobile devices, they wanted to rather have specifically produced content that works within uh, the constraints of the platform. And surprisingly, video and, and images also didn't work as well. Audio, however, did. And um, that brought me to my most important insight, I think, that there's horses for courses in a way, and we need to think about, as museums, we need to think about what sort of visitor behavior we actually want to encourage. Um, which is the same challenge with, with, with any mobile content on site, so it's not limited to, to beacon technology. But we don't want to get into the way of the museum experience that visitors come to us for in the first place. So there's an, an inherent risk to zap visitors out of their immersive experience and, and, and pushing them into sort of a digital tunnel that takes them away from the real. And that's just something that we need to be aware of. and uh, that means acknowledging that there's multiple stages to a visitor journey that might be more suitable to, um, to serve up richer content. So maybe while they're in the galleries, they don't want to read the lengthy text, but after their visit, when they're kind of winding down in the, in the museum cafe, they might. And that's just something to keep in mind. So if we go back to uh, that initial hypothesis, I've practiced this word a lot. <laughs> hypothesis, hypothesis, hypothesis. Uh, I would like to change this um, to something more along the lines of this hypothesis. Um, as a visitor, I want to be able to bookmark the objects I'm looking at to access in-depth information and quench my thirst for knowledge when it suits me, which I think is a very um, important um, differentiation and food for thought. Thank you very much, and uh, talk to you later.